there are three main myths about the Arab Spring, including the Egyptian uh, revolution. One is that this is a Facebook, uh, Twitter revolution. And while Facebook and Twitter are just um, are tools, they weren't even uh, the most influential tools in mobilization. So we find actually that the biggest demonstrations happened on the 28th when the internet was cut off uh, throughout Egypt. We also find that Twitter and Facebook have been used for calling on demonstrations for more than three years in Egypt prior to January 25th. And we never had that turnout. So actually, uh, it was a number of reasons and tools, uh, not specifically Facebook and Twitter. But again, I think um, the media, especially the Western media, have an interest in putting forward such a sexy story of you know young people who look like their American or European counterparts who use Facebook and Twitter and bring about change. The majority of those who were uh, uh, participating in, in those revolutions are actually don't have the subsistence levels to, to even have internet uh, access. And you could see it w when the demonstration started, uh, the ones who were actually knew about it because of Facebook or Twitter were not more than a few thousands. But then wa when we marched and started chanting and people saw the police uh, 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 beating us brutally, that's when the majority interfered and, and that was the tipping point of changing this from a, a demonstration to um, a revolution. The second myth is that this came out of the blue. Suddenly, you know, the Tunisian, Egyptian, um, Syrian people woke up. And again, that's not true. There has been mobilization throughout the past decade in the Arab world. The two critical uh, episodes were uh, the second Palestinian Intifada in the in year 2000 and the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, followed by the, the Israeli war, uh, war in Lebanon and then the war um, on Gaza. And in all, each of those uh, uh, moments, there were huge uh, protests, which I think of as sort of uh, um, rehearsals for uh, the revolution. The third myth is that this is something that has been inspired by democracy promotion efforts of the American administration and the European governments and civil society institutions, uh, be it Freedom House or the book by someone called Jean Sharp. Again, a myth. And I think it's very, um, it's very insulting. It's as if uh, there has, when, when the Arab people do something that the world thinks of as positive, it has to be um, Western influenced or inspired somehow. So they have to have part of the cake. Whereas those governments are actually a part of the reason why authoritarianism endured in the region. So it's not the opposite, but they think that now it's time to actually um, claim a credit. The, the silliest thing I've, uh, I last uh, heard was that um, the WikiLeaks guy, uh, whatever his name, uh, Julian Assange, um, is claiming that actually WikiLeaks played a huge role um, in inspiring the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution. That's because he spent a few days uh, in Egypt in 2007. You're talking about um, a country where 40% of the population are illiterate, cannot read and write Arabic, let alone to be able to um, read English or be inspired by WikiLeaks or whatnot. Uh, the majority of Egyptians do not ha even have access to the internet, let alone uh, even newspapers. So, I mean, this was something that's absolutely homegrown. There were a number of changes that have been brewing in the Arab world for more than two decades. Taken together, they actually form the foundation, the foundational causes for, for those uprisings and revolution. One is the shift to neoliberal policies, economic neoliberal policies. 
What this meant is that the state was withdrawing from public um, uh, expenditures, cutting them down, and hence cutting down uh, social services, education, health care, pensions, employment, so on and so forth. While at the same time, it was putting forward policies that concentrated wealth in the hands of the few. And hence, not only were um, more and more people being deprived of basic subsistence, but at the same time, they're, they're also seeing other groups, small uh, um, amounts of people in those societies who are becoming um, rich in a way that we have never seen before. You find uh, people living in uh, unhumane conditions, um, shanty towns and neighborhoods where they don't even have their own uh, bathroom, they don't have uh, running water, so on and so forth. And just, you know, um, a few kilometers away, you see those gated uh, communities that have golf courses and so on and so forth. You find uh, complete whole villages in Egypt that are um, going out in demonstrations because they don't have water in summer, which we, we used to call the thirst uh, protests because people are thirsty. And at the same time, um, those compounds and resorts are wasting huge uh, uh, amounts of water on go golf courses. And just, this is just an example of um, the inequality. The Egyptian regime and the rest of the Arab regimes came across as dominated by uh, subsequent American administrations, uh, whether in terms of their position towards Palestine or the position towards the, uh, the American invasion of Iraq. And this Arab identity is very much alive in, in this region. So when you find that those regimes are actually uh, not protecting um, our national dignity in a way. And, and at the same time, you're seeing the atrocities that the American um, uh, army commits in Iraq. You're seeing the atrocities that the Israelis uh, commit in Palestine and Lebanon. And you have regimes at home who are not able to stand up uh, for this in any uh, proper way. Basically, regimes with no spine whatsoever. Again, this fueled um, into the anger. And as I said earlier, it's not a coincidence that the biggest demonstrations the Arab world have seen before the Arab Spring has been on occasions of Israeli uh, um, aggression and American aggression in the region. The third uh, thing is that throughout the past decade, there has been a rising plethora of social movements. We've, we found um, independent labor unions being formed, professional syndicates organizing um, rallies, uh, students organizing boycott movements on campuses, so on and so forth. And hence, while the regime was losing all kinds of economic and political legitimacy, at the same time, different groups within civil society were actually starting uh, organization and even though the, this, those organizations started for very limited and specific demands, it helped break the barrier of fear against those regimes. The number of participants in the Egyptian revolution who are actually politicized or f follow any of the specific political organizations uh, did not amount to more than 10 to 15 percent maximum of the participants. But as I said, uh, same thing in the Tunisian um, revolution where you didn't actually have any parties, uh, political parties, and in Syria where you also don't have any parties. Uh, those are spontaneous um, uprisings, revolution, and that's by definition what a revolution is, it's spontaneous, that is um, fed by the inadequacies of those regimes and that built on uh, people grievances that they've expressed um, in other times and elsewhere. And hence there is no one 
organization or even a group of organization can decide which way the revolution uh, can go, whether it's going to be an Islamist revolution as Iran, that's act absolutely out of question. If you look at the slogans and the chants and the demands of Tunisian people uh, during the revolution or the Egyptian people um, or the Syrians now, you will not find any religious slogan. People were calling for um, toppling the regime. They were calling for um, freedom, human dignity, and social justice. And this is definitely not colored by any religious um, sentiments. Today, for example, we have a huge uh, call for demonstrations in Cairo. And there are hundreds of thousands of people um, throughout uh, Egypt in different squares, Tahrir and elsewhere. And the Muslim Brotherhood, up until two days ago, have not endorsed uh, those uh, demonstrations and protests. And this tells you uh, their standing. But that's equally applicable to all organized forces in Egypt and throughout the Arab world. As it stands, there isn't any single political organization that has enough clout to decide the direction of uh, the revolution or to color it in any ideological way. People have come out on specific demands and grievances, and they will continue to mobilize until those demands are met, whether uh, political organizations mm, tell them to do or not. The only difference is some political organizations on the left are actually um, more uh, affiliated or relate to those demands, and hence they participate and they support um, those demands, but they're equally participants. They're not leaders. Everything nowadays and up to the scheduled elections in September is and will be in flux. This is a huge process that cannot be reduced to um, elections or electoral changes. You find ups and downs between uh, divisions between the different uh, political factions in Tunisia or in Egypt at some points, and then at other points you find consensus about uh, around specific uh, demands. As I said, there isn't clear leadership yet. There are media icons. There are people who are uh, more known because they're famous, they come up on TV a lot, they speak a different language, they belong to a certain class. But do those people, can those people actually dictate the course of change? No, they can't. And for me, this is something very inspiring and reassuring because it means that no one can actually broker deals to stop uh, the revolution. That it will continue to go on until the people, the masses who made it a revolution, believe that they have been satisfied. I'm not worried about the fact that there are no leaders or that no one is coming uh, 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 up or uh, will be able to, who, who is going to be able to win elections. We've, we've broken such a huge barrier with this revolution that for me it actually doesn't matter. If we end up with a parliament that does not perform its chores the way we think it, it should perform its chores, we will take to the streets and we will change the parliament. And I know some people will think of this as chaos because they think of the change in terms of very limited democratic transition having to do with um, regular elections. But I think what we're looking at in Egypt and the Arab world is a much more structural, systematic change than just bringing about free, fair, regular elections. We're talking about um, changes in the economic structure. We're talking about changes um, in how the power structure is devised. And this is much more important than elections. When um, independent unions, uh, farmers and activists uh, now are pushing and demanding for a minimum wage uh, and a maximum wage, when they're pushing for progressive uh, taxation, when they're 
pushing for a redistribution of wealth and taking back of um, factories and corporations that belong to um, the ex-elite, we're definitely talking about major structural change. Having said that, because it's, it's looking for major structural change, it ends up threatening a lot of interests, not only in Egypt, but in the region and in the world. Neoliberalism has not been localized. It's not a local model. It's a global model. And the rise of alternative models, be it in Bolivia or in Egypt, is threatening for um, the pillars of that model what it represents both in terms of a hegemony, in terms of the ideas, and in terms of the domination of um, forces, the American administration, the G8, and so on and so forth. And hence, the counter-revolution um, in Egypt, in the Arab world, does not only include the remains of the ruling parties and uh, the political elite, but it also includes uh, the Gulf monarchies, Saudis heading them. It includes the American administration. It includes European governments, so on and so forth. All of them want to stop those revolutions short of being a revolution and change them into cosmetic changes of some sort of elections and very teeny weeny concepts of liberal democracy, not participatory democracy. There is already pushback on different levels. So, as I spoke earlier, the, the role of the American administration and the Saudi monarchy of crushing down the Bahraini uprising. And this has been um, crucial. As much as what happened in Tunisia and the success of the Tunisian uprising what gave confidence to Egyptians, the crushing down of the Bahraini uprising and what we're seeing in Syria and Libya, especially with the NATO um, intervention and the longevity of the, of the war, is at, dissuades a lot of um, people from rising up in their countries. Again, the US is not, and Saudi Arabia, is not far from the, the stalling that's happening in Yemen. And this is part of uh, the counter-revolution that has impact on the, the process of the revolution in those countries, but also in countries that didn't start seeing an uprising yet. That's one. Uh, the other thing, you look at how the military council in Egypt has been dealing with the revolution. Since the toppling of Mubarak on the 11th of February, uh, the military council have put around 10,000 civilians, tried them and convicted them in martial uh, military courts, which is completely unacceptable. But again, while doing this, they're also stalling the, the trials of Mubarak and figures from the regime. And those trials are not about a vendetta, they're about accountability. But they don't want accountability because the military council is part of the regime. It was appointed by Mubarak, uh, uh, they have comradeship with Mubarak, and hence that's part of, and they consult very um, heavily with the American administration. Over the past uh, uh, few months, I mean, uh, McCain, Hillary Clinton, you name it, there isn't a week where you don't have an American official uh, visiting and actually uh, um, helping um, some con concerted effort in terms of how to stop this uh, short. The fear and the threat is not that they will not secede power to a civilian government. The fear and the threat is that even though they will secede power to a civilian government, that they will continue to have um, an improper uh, power, powerful standing within um, the public life in Egypt. Regional forces, Saudi Arabia and Israel, on top of the counter-revolutionary uh, elements, 
in the region uh, using the Israelis or using their political clout in uh, pressuring the American administration even more to the right. The Saudis are using their political clout as much as their money as well to try to push forward a certain course of the American administration. That trio of the Americans, the Israelis, and the Saudis, and when I refer to those, I'm referring to governments, of course, not general population, um, is that that's what I would call the axis of evil. That's the axis of evil. What we're seeing in Egypt, as much as we've, we're, we've seen in Tunisia, is actually the rise of different forms and ways of organization. Uh, different models of participatory democracy at its best. So we're looking at the rise of neighborhood committees, what we call Ligan al an al-Sawra and popular committees, Ligan al shabaya And those are actually um, groups of people who participated in the revolution, who took back to their community um, certain ideas and are actually, they're concerned about how to bring the revolution in every neighborhood, um, in every village and community in Egypt. They're overseeing how uh, bread is being distributed. They're making sure that um, local uh, candidates from the dissolved ruling party um, do not run in the upcoming elections. They're uh, publishing their own uh, newsletters. They're having local um, radio stations and even local TV stations, which I just discovered, where they just put this device in, in a home or a workshop and they, they broadcast messages that people can get um, within a certain range. And this is amazing. This is a different way of doing business, of doing politics, that I think um, transcends uh, the deadlock that representative democracy have reached uh, in industrial democracies of Europe and North America. And I think this is uh, very important. And I can't think of this in isolation of a different economic system. People are not doing this for the sake of it. People are doing this to change the power uh, structure of which economics is a major um, part. As much as when I was talking about neoliberalism as a global model, the disadvantages and the dynamics it creates, the negative dynamics, are also uh, global. And hence, it was not a coincidence for me when people in Wisconsin um, were protesting um, and making references to Tahrir Square, right? Because the grievances are just uh, the same, whatever um, color or language they take. And I think that's, that's the scary part about those revolutions, is that they will not stop just within the boundaries um, of a region far away. If they succeed, they will be an inspiration for a different model that can take over um, the world. There's so much the American people have done and can continue to do. I can't tell you how much um, heartening it was to see um, just regular people in the US or Europe demonstrating when we were in Tahrir. That's human solidarity at its best, cross color and language and ethnicity. Uh, and I can't tell you the effect it had uh, on people. And that's actually what um, drove us to uh, order and deliver pizza to the people when they were protesting in, in Wisconsin. <clears throat> Same thing um, when um, in different European capitals, people were protesting during the Gaza war. Um, this level of human solidarity being shown in um, demonstrations and protests and political messages um, through collective organization is very important and I hope it can continue. And I hope at one point we can coordinate in a way that um, 
on specific date, we will have a demonstration in Tahrir um, where uh, we're calling for better wages and people in LA or San Diego or New York or Wisconsin will be, um, and London and Paris will be um, doing the same. The other thing is pushing the American administration to do one of two things. Either to stop meddling in our business, and that would be absolutely great, but they won't be able to do this. And since they won't be able to actually try to take a more balanced uh, position on the Palestinian issue, which is so important, that's the continuing source of uh, um, unacceptable, inhumane injustices in the world. Uh, to pressure the American administration to stop uh, actually supporting dictators in Bahrain or in Qatar or in Saudi Arabia. The third thing um, I think the American people can do would actually to educate themselves more about the region. The good thing is that we've bypassed that stage where politics is about individuals. We're in a stage where politics is being determined um, within uh, mass organization, and that's very reassuring. Again, taking into consideration that there's a force and there's a counter force. The majority of Egyptians might want something, but the military council, the American administration, or the Israeli um, government will use everything in their power to actually halt some of those things. So, you know, just need to wait and see and be persistent.